to a night of total terror. My name is Tom Brown. I am standing in the Evans City Cemetery. This is where the opening of the classic film Night of the Living Dead was filmed. I first heard about Night of the Living Dead in 1969. I was 14 years old. I had a brand new aunt. She just came in from Los Angeles and she proceeded to tell me, having learned that I was the monster fantasy horror nut in the family, she told me about this dark and scary and creepy movie, this bloody and violent film. This movie that even showed people eating other people. Of course, I wanted to see Night of the Living Dead really bad. And of course, she told my parents not to let me see it. Of course, I eventually did see Night of the Living Dead, and my life has never been the same since. I would never have believed back in 1969 that several years later I would be part of this, a tribute to Night of the Living Dead, the folks that brought it to you, the people that made the film, the greatest horror film ever made. The Night of the Living Dead come about. George and I were having lunch in a tavern around the corner from the late Dimage, the company where we all worked. Remember? We were in uh, <laughs> Sam Marini's eating grilled provolone sandwiches and sipping beer with Richard Ritchie and complaining about the commercial jobs that we lost, how fickle the advertising agencies were. And I uh, turned to you and Richard and said, 
uh, what if we get 10 of us together, just the people that work at Latent Image and, and a few of our friends, we'd and just get 10 people and uh, each of us kick in 600 bucks. Even if we have to borrow the money, we'd have 6,000 uh, bucks. We should be able to make a, a, a movie on that or at least you know, get it down to a work print. Sh uh, shoot it in 35, print it in 16, and we should be able to do a better movie than those things with, with rubber masks that we've all seen. And uh, I like those things. Huh? Yeah, those rubber, rubber masks. masks. <laughs> I think it's interesting, though, to to consider from a from a point of view of uh, first of all not having very much money to work with, and secondly, then to uh, get together, cobble together whatever little money you can to make some kind mm -hmm. of movie that you could almost certainly sell to someone. Hopefully, uh, yes. The horror thing mm -hmm. was almost backed into in that way. I know that one of the rationales was that if, um, if uh, Bill Cardell, if someone bought those movies that were on uh, Chiller Theater at that time, <coughs> someone <coughs> would certainly buy anything that, that we could do. Yeah, that, that was part of the rationale. Yeah, I mean, I think important to say, too, that initially we, we wanted to make a movie. Right, right. Uh, and we backed into horror after we tried to talk to various people we about other it. things. <laughs> we didn't know anyone who had any horses. So that Western, right. was Western was out. <laughs> Uh, no one listened whenever we would talk about something else. Why didn't we shoot in color? Who wants to explain that one? Well, w we w did talk at one point <laughs> about converting to 16 millimeter color, mm -hmm. and but then decided, nah. Wasn't it essentially the fact that we couldn't afford it? Initially color? it was, but yeah. I, I don't think ultimately that was, because then when we raised the extra dough, I mean, unless I'm remembering it wrong, wasn't there a point where we decided, well, all we'd have to reshoot is a little bit of stuff and we could switch yeah. to color 16. Mm -hmm. There were, there were a number of considerations like that that eventually somehow got committed out of the production, shooting a different ending, you know, was the ending too, too much of a downer. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. There were a couple of right. instances Oh, that like was that. It, long <laughs> after. Yeah. That, I mean, was, even that was well after that. When Russ and I <laughs> drove to New York with the first print mm -hmm. in the car, and the first people that looked at it were Columbia, it was Columbia Pictures, and they wanted us to change the ending. And we did, you know, sort of bravely say, get out of my life to a couple of people. <laughs> Are you people crazy? Right. Then about six months later, we were calling them back and saying, can we make a deal? Uh, how would you like that ending change, sir? The lady <laughs> holding the torch. We'd, we've thought about it. We <laughs> talked it over with our friends and yes, we'll do anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> terror, nightmares, uh, and a good time, actually, and a classic title. How nervous it made me when I first saw it. My uh, father took me, I was pretty old then, I mean, I didn't need my father to take me, but we went to the movies together to see Play Misty for me, which was the movie that was the uh, A picture. And Play Misty for me put my stomach into knots. Then my father, who didn't want to see this Night of the Living Dead, said, I'm going to a bar, I'll meet you. I'll meet you out in front of the movie theater when this is over. And uh, coming off of Play Misty for me and then going right into the Night of the Living Dead um, was really unnerving and really unsettling. And I had been told what a great movie Night of the Living Dead was. And I said, well, I'll go see it. So I went to see it. And I was very taken with it because almost everything about it is attractive. I mean, the politics of it were striking at the time to have a black lead. And that's not commented on the fact that he's black. Uh, also to kill him, <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, the clear anti 
communist hysteria that's running through that film, all the stuff about guns and hunters and gun control, the dynamics of the family. And there was so much going on in the movie that it wasn't your typical horror film. Um, the black and white photography, the, 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 the handheld jerkiness of a lot of the shots, the, uh, the, it's one of those movies where the circumstances under which it was filmed helped it. Um, it helped even the bad like news guy and stuff, it helped the reality of it. The horror that I felt when I first saw the picture, I was very young and I saw it with my sister, Andrea, she took me to see it, and it was on a double bill with freaks, so it was a double mind blower for me as a kid. And I was so scared, my stomach got tied up in a terrible knot, and uh, I had just never experienced any kind of fear like it in my entire life. Screaming in New York. <laughs> uh, when I very, very first was thinking about making a, a scary movie, um, I was just in New York uh, learning the film business and um, was still working on my first very preliminary films as an assistant editor when I uh, was dragged by friends to go see Night of the Living Dead at the Waverly uh, down in the Lower East Side. And um, I really thought it was kind of a stupid idea. You know, I, I, I was not uh, somebody who set off to make scary films. So as far as I was concerned, they uh, you know, were something that uh, I had not seen much of and were probably pretty dumb. And instead, in the first three minutes, I found myself, along with everybody else in the audience, screaming and laughing and jumping and uh, cringing, and uh, realized that uh, you know, a scary film could be a lot of fun and very stylishly made, and even have a, uh, you know, a, some sort of a political underlying statement behind it that was, uh, you know, made you think a little bit. Actually, the, the, I was thinking about this, because I knew you were going to ask a question like this. And the, what r reminds me is when I was about like eight years old, because I, I grew up in the Bay Area, and there was this TV show called Creature Features, hosted by Bob Wilkins uh, from this Oakland station. And it was the, the horror movie uh, show that they had on Saturday nights. And on the opening of the show, they always had they had like clips from all these horror films. But the one the one that scared me the most uh, was from Night of the Living Dead. And it was the part when <laughs> they go up the stairs and they find the body that was that was devoured. And there's that big zoom in on the face. And that that every time it's like the show the the credits are come on and that big zoom in came in. Whoa! I almost fell backwards. And the the big zoom would come in and I'd always just basically shit my pants right there. I don't know. That always just scared me. I also was greatly encouraged by it because it was a regional film. It was made by a bunch of guys in, you know, Pennsylvania. And I was thinking, gee, that's kind of neat. And uh, my first film, Schlock, which I made in L.A. for 60000 bucks, well, I was encouraged because I said, well, if they can do it. You know, I mean, guys, let's put on a show like Judy and Mickey, you know, get the money together. But the movie really struck me mainly because I thought it was really scary. And even now, I think there's power in it. There's, there's scenes that are just so uh, cleverly... I mean, I'm, I don't know if it's designed or happenstance, but for instance, the, the, the father of the family, you know, they have the... The fact that he's such a jerk, he's right, by the way. I mean, at the end of the movie, you realize he was right. He was right, <laughs> you know. And the image of the daughter eating the mother, you know, it's like, ah! I mean, there's, they're just stuff in that picture. They have the lead, similar to the way Hitchcock killed off Janet Lee. I think even bolder is to have your lead go catatonic. Um, I mean, there's just a very, it's a movie that surprised and kept surprising. I was... Uh watching TV late at night and I remember this movie coming on I think I was I can't remember I was very young and uh, I was 11 years old actually and I remember watching the movie uh, on TV late at night and when it first came on and the car driving up the road in black and white I knew I was in store for a pretty spooky movie because just the whole tone from the first frame just pretty much uh, gave me the heebie-jeebies well, while he was having his diapers changed, um, I was—I uh, remember having many a sleepover with uh, several friends. We we would we would stay up and watch uh, watch the film, you know, whatever creature feature it was on, and uh, we'd have popcorn and get really scared. And I remember not being able to go to sleep at night. Gritty black and white, um, noirish, uh, evil, uh, insidious, uh, basically uh, horror. I think. Uh, would be the one adjective he used to perfectly describe. Well, first of all, whenever we were talking about $6,000, Richard Ritchie said, you guys are crazy. You'll never make a movie. I can't believe I'm hearing this. And uh, we said, does that mean that you want out? And he said, oh, no, I'm in. <laughs> 
So he come up with his $600, and we went back to the studio, and we talked to Russ. Russ he was said, one of the oh, only yeah. guys that had $600. In his <laughs> yeah, that's right. He, was, he had a real job. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us had to borrow the money from parents and finance mm. companies and so on. But Russ said, sure, I'm in. I'll, I'll spend the afternoon working out some figures. And he got done, and he comes out with this gloomy look on his face, and he says, I got some real bad news. It's we can't do it for six thousand. It's going to cost twelve thousand. <laughs> oh no! We said, oh, there goes the movie. <laughs> no movie. That's a story I didn't know. Originally, yeah. you, you came up with double what we had. Huh? Well, we had image <laughs> ten. The ten people that kicked in six hundred right. each. That was the six thousand. And George was in utter gloom. He said, "You know, it's all down the drain because if we bring in another ten people for another six hundred, there's no percentage left. There's no profits for anybody." And that's when we hit on the idea, well, the first 10, people like you and Marilyn Eastman and, mm -hmm. and so on, those people were going to contribute not only money, but they were going to work on the picture in important ways. So, so those people uh. deserved a higher percentage than the second 10, and that's how we, we brought the, the second 10 in at a reduced percentage so there was some money left over for the hopeful prop, hope for profits. I mean, it also have to say that by the time we were done, it cost more than twelve thousand yeah. dollars. Oh yeah, um, yeah, one hundred and fourteen thousand. Yeah, one hundred fourteen. Yeah, with the deferments. But the amount, we, the amount yeah. of cash was like around seventy. Yeah, between sixty and seventy mm -hmm. somewhere, which is still, I mean, bargain basement. Even you know, uh, nineteen sixty-seven dollars. That's still uh, pretty mm -hmm. unheard of. Dirt cheap. Also important to say that you can't just raise six thousand dollars and go out and make a movie. I mean, we had equipment and know-how, and right. between us, between your equipment, our equipment, we had two separate companies. Um, yeah. We didn't have to go rent stuff. We knew how to use the stuff. And you guys did the makeup. I mean, the yeah. half the staff, That's half the production credits uh, are represented. Here now in these four people, and that's, there, that's there were true. four other people that did the rest, and uh, yeah, that's then true. there was a lawyer. And <laughs> <laughs> One of the guys oh, was yes. a lawyer. Well, it was <laughs> like uh, um, the very week that we bought our first 35 millimeter camera was the week that we were sitting there in the bar, and uh, yeah. you know now we had everything we needed, including the. Uh, the, the camera where and that was a used camera, wasn't it? It was a used, right. used sure. a heavy millimeter. eighty pound blimp thirty five millimeter camera. That, oh yes, that, uh, remember the burden that it was? Yeah, very uh, well. Just setting up <laughs> shots and uh, and uh, getting the mat, uh, the the lenses in that thing, and uh, just transporting it from one one area of the house to the next. That's a, a mm -hmm. recollection. Although there was. The equipment was clumsy and awkward at the time. There was so much energy, mm -hmm. you you hardly don't remember right. it as being an encumbrance. It was our stuff. He also didn't think he'd get the role because Rudy Ritchie was was going to play that role originally. Yeah. He was one of our friends and shareholders mm -hmm. and Dwayne just assumed well you're white you're a shareholder and you're a close friend of these guys and I'm not going to get the part and he was actually stunned when he got the part. Yeah, he but was Dwayne visiting was from New York visiting his uh, mm -hmm. family but in Duquesne. But you yes. guys knew him a friend. You? No, Mary was, Ellen uh, knew him. Mary Ellen Hawkey oh, knew, knew him. She, oh, so okay. he was a, a, a friend of a mutual friend. Yeah. Oh, I see okay. I think it wasn't until when he did his big table scene that you know, ripping the table apart and all that, which was his big speech. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was this big catharsis that day when he suddenly realized that all of us were pulling for him and we were all in this together. Yeah. And uh, up to that moment, he still felt like, like an outsider. Maybe. Yes, yes, he did. Yeah. And that uh, was that too after bad. that, he just, he just collapsed in tears and went around shaking our hands and hugging us. and. He realized that you know, white, black, or whatever, we were yeah. we were right. All, At first, all, he yeah. thought he would never get the role, and then I think, then he thought, w was he being exploited to something? I mean, he went right. through all those there, exactly, about, <coughs> and then finally realized, hey, we're just making a movie. You know? mm -hmm. 
or we're we're all sort of trying to you know get this. Yeah, the collar right. didn't have anything to do no. with it. No, That's it didn't. The simple no. fact of it. Repeating this latest bulletin just received moments ago from Cumberland, Maryland, civil defense authorities have told newsmen that murder victims show evidence of having been partially devoured by their murderers. Medical examination of victims' bodies shows conclusively that the killers are eating the flesh of the people they kill. That was a, a thing that sort of evolved, and it got it got har harder and harder and heavier and heavier. We did initially say we're going to go a little further than these other movies go, but then we kept watching dailies and realized we weren't. Maybe we could go another inch. Maybe we could go another inch. In the end, the last shoot mm -hmm. that we went out and did was almost specifically to. We were, we were filling some plot points too, mm -hmm. but we mm -hmm. went out specifically to get a few more uh, graphic shots. I mean, you look at the film now, and it looks really tame. Oh, compared with what's compared with well, we knew that we sense? had to be sure. iconoclastic with the picture. We figured maybe nobody would want to distribute it, and we'd end up carrying it by hand to the various drive-in theaters and selling it that way. So we wanted to make sure it would get noticed. So we were always breaking new ground uh, intentionally yeah. and forcing forcing the picture into into more daring areas than, than other films had gone. One of the things that, uh, speaking of the gore, uh, that led to you know, what we did there was the fact that one of, one of the people involved, Ross Harris, in a chain of meat stores, butcher shops is what they're called, <laughs> meat stores, <laughs> butcher shops. <laughs> and uh, Ross uh, went out to uh, slaughterhouses and bought product. And he said, listen, I can get entrails, I can get livers, he said, I can get anything you want from when I go to the slaughterhouse. And he, uh, he made good on his promise and that's why we Right. Uh, one of the reasons we went that way. It started a whole subgenre. Little did we know. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I know that one of the things that uh, that we talked about early on was not making the special effects, the gunshots and so forth, too ambitious. That whatever we did, we wanted to be able to pull off well. Mm -hmm. Right. And with uh, Reed Servinsky and some of those folks, we were at least able to execute. Mm -hmm gunshots and bullet holes and that kind of thing. With rather. good reality. Yeah. Again, with good reality <laughs> and, and I think that all kind of helped the movie too but mm -hmm. then as George says you you know you test a little bit with this and and eventually ratchet it up to where it is now but where it is now is is so so uh, modest compared to what has been done since. With today. Yeah. 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 Well it's you like know there isn't we didn't do a headshot they they didn't they refuse to do squibs on the head, yeah. and so every zombie that gets shot in the head gets, you know, you see the reaction, right. and then you cut to a, an, a, a, <coughs> uh, an existing an makeup that's yeah. right. already there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The only squibs are in the bo are on bo uh, on the body. Right. Yeah, I think the first one we did that way was Richard Ritchie. Right. At the uh, window. At the window. And he gets shot in the head. The back final. of the head. Right. And that was yeah. because he was one of the investors and he had no choice but to put a squib <laughs> on the back of his head. And, that, and you know, that's a good point, Ross. You mean there's a squib on his head? Yeah. The, Are you yeah. sure? I, I really I, must not have been around. Was, he was, he was <laughs> he wrestling with I thought the, we did some sort of a gizmo on the front of his head that wasn't really a squib. The reason you forgot that it was there, and I forgot too until Russ just mentioned it, it uh, we had a thing on the front of his head, yeah. but we shot the squib, but the it was too dark and it never really registered. Right. You barely <laughs> see it. But the thing I was, like Russ mentioned before uh, about yes. investors helping us go into new areas where, you know, Vince's, Vince Servinsky's brother Reed came in as an investor and turned out to be a fireworks specialist. And, and, and uh, just like the, mm -hmm. you know, Carl's friend, Ross Harris came in and, and furnished the, the I'm a specialist parts. with entrails. Here yeah, comes so. uh, Vince and uh, uh, and Reach. Reach and, and b because of having them there, we were able to do the demolitions and the squibs, which we, we really didn't count on right. going in. Uh, well, here's all those shots from 1967 yeah. on the makeup that we did. And here's one of, uh, this one of Jack, um, Jack Russo. Jack Where Russo, oh, yeah, over here, are. that was better known that was days. one of your better ones. Yeah. That was great. You knew that the genesis of this makeup, the, the wounds, 
that is, mm -hmm. was from the Enchanted Cottage when I was a messenger at uh, RKO mm -hmm. in Hollywood. I think that's great. Yeah. You really liked that movie because you <laughs> yeah. looked like you tried to redo well, it. <laughs> I, I used to hang around the, uh, the makeup department. And I think one of the uh, Westmores was in charge of it at the time, but I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, they used, uh, on Robert Young's face, uh, they used Dermawax to create the uh, distortion. Because he was a, a war a hero. A war hero mm -hmm. had been wounded. And uh, so I just absorbed that. And when it came time for Living Dead, I thought, aha, here's a way we get our, our uh, wounds, our gross wounds. Mm -hmm. So uh, we searched, found the Dermawax, and... Uh, the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> and here you are doing makeup on a couple of the ghouls. Yeah. Although I did most of the ghoul, the regular makeup, yeah. the straight makeup. Uh, well, you did it in stages also. Yeah, well, that was, it was really interesting the way the makeup uh, sort of progressed. If you watch the film, you'll see that uh, the makeup changes. In the beginning, everybody is a raccoon. Yeah. <laughs> Dark eyes, dark circles, and... Uh, right. <laughs> and um, I was doing what I knew then, which was mm -hmm. theater makeup, and that was to enhance uh, and to diminish anything that was wrong with the face. Right. And then I yeah. gradually realized that with a ghoul, you go the opposite way. <laughs> yeah. So if somebody had a big face, you make their face bigger. Yeah. If somebody has a, a narrow face, you make their face very narrow and small. Uh, if they have little eyes, you make their eyes little beady eyes so the makeup got better as the movie went on and of course as we uh, as we progressed with the production uh, then we had we had it kind of down to a, a formula and we instructed various of the ghouls to put on what we called a base makeup mm -hmm. uh, uh, as Chuck Craig is doing here uh, and then you went in and finished it with uh, the shading, the rouge, the black, the brown. Mm -hmm. um, and I also did the makeup on the nude. Oh, that's right. Which was, that's right. yeah, she <laughs> was too pretty and pink. <laughs> so we had to cover her with gray. That's right, a, yeah. a greenish gray, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't tell that in the black and white film. but. No. And there's Roger. Yeah, Roger. Oh, boy, that was a good Roger one. Roger McGovern. And Betty Ellen Hawhey. Yes. See, a lot of people thought Betty Ellen Hawhey was the lady who ate the bug from the tree, but she was not. I was the lady who ate the bug from the tree. I was mm -hmm. filling in because we were short on ghouls that night, so I did a little extra role as a bug-eating ghoul. <laughs> and um, I don't think I have one of those here. Yeah. Oh, and, and Chuck Craig. Chuck Craig, yes. That was a great one, yeah. Carl. And we our honeymoon couple. Yes. There were... <laughs> They went off the bridge, uh, a Chappaquiddick or something like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I don't think uh, that came later. <laughs> and this was more subtle makeup. This was Rich yeah. Sanderson. And this is as the film progressed, um, and we were using less of the, you know, the black around the mm -hmm. eyes. And he looks really good. He yeah. made a great ghoul. I forget how he died now, but uh, it died le leaving him a very dark gray. <laughs> <laughs> He looked good. Yeah, that was... Uh, and Miss December. Miss December. That was yep. Paula Richards. She was our receptionist. Yes, at the time, yes. At the studio. So yeah. she, she was our first lady ghoul, wearing a sheet, which yes. she devised <laughs> herself. Because we also did the costumes, which came mostly from Goodwill. And uh, at the bottom of many people's closets... Mm -hmm. Things that have been discarded, or were <coughs> excuse me, were about to be discarded. And Keith mm -hmm. Wayne, of course, he didn't have ghoul makeup. He was a great-looking guy. Still is a great-looking guy. He's a chiropractor now. So we just did straight mm -hmm. makeup for Keith. So lots of memories. Many, many memories indeed. Hot summer days, doing the makeup under the tree with the mosquitoes and the gnats. And it was. It was difficult because the makeup would have to wear off and we'd have to refresh it periodically. And we didn't mm. have running water, so we had yes. to carry little thermoses <laughs> of water, which were for both drinking and makeup. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whichever came first. Which we tried to uh, keep separate, separate yeah. of course. <laughs> the whole 
newsroom environment was created yeah. at your uh, recording studio. Hard Associates. Uh, right. mm -hmm. at, uh, with real yeah. professional <laughs> annunciatorial types. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <People> <laughs> who, and it looked good, you know, because we <laughs> had that big uh, control room deck that looked down into uh, yeah. the studios on, on both sides. Yeah. So it did look real. But great. Right. Those sequences are often talked about as some of the, w the stuff that really plays, uh, you know, very, the, the, the news. Authentically? Sti the, yeah, the, the newsreel stuff and, yeah. the, you know, announcing the um, rescue centers and all that. And Chuck, yeah, didn't right. Chuck write Chuck his Craig? own copy? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he yes, was he a did. news guy and he wrote uh, his own copy. Chuck I think. Craig, that's right. It has been established that persons who have recently died have been returning to life and committing acts of murder. A widespread investigation of reports from funeral homes, morgues, and hospitals has concluded that the unburied dead are coming back to life and seeking human victims. The thing about the, the names of the towns at the bottom of the screen was another attempt on our part to make sure that maybe the picture would attract some attention because we, picture, we picked real towns in, in the Pittsburgh area thinking, mm -hmm. you know, well, people that see Clareton up there or McKeesport, Glassport, they're going to talk about that and get us some word of mouth. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it worked, but we were calculating every, <laughs> every single shot that we could. It didn't work real well in Indianapolis or Chicago. <laughs> no, they hated it. They, they, they didn't know any of the names of the towns. <laughs> There's a number of scenes that stand out that are particularly terrifying for me. One was uh, just a moment where Barbara is looking down at this, uh, this corpse and suddenly it jerks to life. But then we realize it's not alive. Uh, Dwayne, the actor, is actually pulling this body away. It was just a great frightening moment and a good uh, switch around reveal that it wasn't really coming back to life. Well, there's a, you know, the, the whole picture uh, just seems to roll as a sort of a continuous wave over you, but, you know, certainly that, that opening in the cemetery. The guy with the, uh, who was, I think, the, the zombie in the, in the graveyard that uh, they're coming to get you, Barbara, bit, that whole sequence, that's what uh, uh, pretty much made me turn off the television. I was too frightened to, to continue watching it. I think when the arms were reaching in uh, into the house and they were fending them off, that was another horrifying moment. There's several key scenes that I personally like, mm -hmm. but one of the ones I think to me that's uh, the most frightening is the boyfriend and girlfriend who are trying to get the truck, and they're and they're going to the truck and they gotta get the they gotta go get the gas and the the girl I want to come with you and so. <laughs> <laughs> they're going along, and he brings a girl. And I had a crush on that girl. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, thought, I thought she was cute. She was quite a babe. Anyway, so, <laughs> and the dopey boyfriend, and they go, and, and she screws up, and the truck blows up, and I was just shocked. How can they kill these characters? And they were the first of the major characters that you really liked uh, that, got, that got killed, and I, I, was just, I was just blown away. Not, not only because so I had, an, aff I had a, a, an, an affection for this girl, of course, uh, but also... Uh, I couldn't believe that that could be done in a, in, in a movie like this, that they would just kill off these characters that I was starting to like. They're coming to get you. I, I don't know. There are many things. I couldn't, I couldn't come up with one. The uh, little child in the cellar, when she came back, that was really bad. Really scary, I mean. A really uh, bad time for me as a kid. At the time, the thing that struck me, there were some shots that are very clumsy. Um, artless, but in fact make them more powerful, which is people chewing on like pieces of meat or livers or something. And it was just, you didn't see that stuff in movies in the, in the, in, at that time, or at least I hadn't seen it up to that point. When it's not so bad that they couldn't get away, but they, they, they chose to just kind of, you know, they set a chair on fire and kick it out front. And I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, about 30 minutes in the early part of the film where they don't have to stay. They could try to, it, it wasn't so bad that they could try to get away. And there's just this sort of that indecisiveness and the people trying to make a decision what's best for, for their own well-being. That, that's just kind of, that's really unsettling because you're just, you're just terrified that they're not making the right decision. And you kind of know, since this movie's called Night of the Living Dead, that they're, they're not going to be making the right decision. And I think there's a mood or something, sort of a, an air of, uh, of suspense and dread in those early early first 30, 40 minutes, I think that's probably really impressive. I get a lot of images that, 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 that are like, it's like a montage that goes all the way through the film because at times uh, I felt like some of the imagery in the graveyard and the opening, some of the very spooky 
uh, wonderful black and white. Uh, at times it looked like it could, this could be a Bergman movie, you know, and uh, and the, the whole film, I think, in, in its thematically what it's doing affected me, um, as well as it scared the hell out of me. And, uh, and I loved being afraid with and listening to the response of the audience because in those days they, they truly blurted out the screams. I remember turning off the television and then like watching pro wrestling for about half an hour, 40 minutes, and I said, well, maybe I'll give it a second chance, and I flipped the channel back, and I remember the sequence where the girl uh, with the trowel is, goes after the mother, and the screaming, and the, the blood against the, the wall. Very effective, very frightening, and uh, definitely made an impression on me, and uh, pretty much uh, was probably the most frightening uh, and most graphic of any film I had seen up to that point. I didn't realize films could go that far and they did and I was pretty shocked. I'm sitting here, uh, Carl, looking over your shoulder and wondering, tell me, oh. could it be that that's <laughs> the coat rack? This is the coat rack with which I, uh, want to touch it anyone? Uh -huh. <laughs> with oh, which I, with I wrestled when I was uh, shot by Dwayne slash Ben in the film. And you still have it after all these years. Oh yes. Well, we have a few artifacts like that. And how left. many times I'm did you... one. <laughs> There's another. <laughs> <laughs> how many uh, times did you drag that thing? Uh, oh gee. George, how many times how... did we shoot your death scene? I know. I thought I was going to have a heart attack and die from laughter. Oh, yeah. because I, <laughs> I was thrown back when I was shot and I lurched over and I tangled with that, <laughs> with that and it had coats, coats on, it. on it. It had coats on it, and, sort of and I got tangled up in the coats. Right at the top of the <laughs> at the top of the steps, the stairs. and right. the thing kept following me down into the stairwell. <laughs> we were never able to untangle him, and he went home with it. And there it is. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There it is. But that was one that went yeah, forever. That's, there yeah. was, and that, there was something else. What was? What was the big? Oh gosh! I know we oh, had the you one. mean another uh, s uh, sequence? Yeah. One was. Uh, when I threw the uh, the torches out, the Molotov, uh, oh, the right, Molotov right, cocktails right. out of the second, I was trying to hit a stone right. Right. down there, right. and sometimes I hit it. And sometimes, <laughs> and sometimes you hit Gary. The audacity, <laughs> you know, the you mean you had to the hit lunacy. The stone. You know, I was the aiming for a stone. Had to break, right. So you right. Had to hit a stone. A stone. Right. That the audience couldn't see was yes, there. That's right. right. And you know, and I just can't believe uh, to this day that I really thought <laughs> that I could hit a stone which was maybe, oh, what, 24 inches across from the second floor window over the porch roof. Right. Well, is it coming? Come on! Get in! I remember George and I sitting around the night before and I said, George, you know, Carl threw all those Molotov cocktails out the window and there are all these zombies that are supposed to be weak and slow moving and yet none of them catch on fire. That's ridiculous. Somebody has to catch on fire. You, and Jack! Who's going to do it? I said, where is well, Jack? Well, I will. Great idea, Jack. <laughs> yeah, good idea. Jeez. How do you think we can pull that off? <laughs> we didn't have an asbestos suit or didn't have money for anything like that, so I just... Uh, you put on three, three or yeah, four I layers wore, of I, well, I had some tight-fitting denim clothing and a loose brown suit over that. Yeah, and, and then uh, a jacket over that. And, and the idea, Didn't you? no, just a denim jacket, denim Levi's, and uh, then the brown suit. And then a brown suit on top and of so that. So you made the, uh, uh, we had a puddle of gasoline on the ground, and you made a trail of gas gasoline from my back down my That's leg. That's right. And so Remember on action, you threw the match into the puddle, the puddle <laughs> ignited and straight up my <laughs> yeah. back, and the plan was for me to just stagger in flames as far as I could until I fell over <laughs> a hill where people were waiting to smother me, you know, the yeah. flames with, with the blanket. <laughs> And I just went oh until till it got till I felt my hair burning. <laughs> <laughs> just keep on going until and you everybody hear was say cut. It was yeah. the, the looks on people's face were, were, were really weird. Like well, it like was you and George because the, I could see this this worried look mixed <laughs> with glee that we're actually <laughs> getting this great shot. <laughs> 
I still have that. And I still get that weird look on my face anytime I see a person on fire. <laughs> part of you enjoys it, and part of you. Yeah, but we got we got three takes on the thing. Yes, yes, we did. It worked. Well, I was worried because that was a spooky thing because mm. you know, we had never done that before, and by dang, you was on fire. <laughs> yes. There were interesting things uh, to me. Uh, the night, for example, mm. that the uh, the getaway truck uh, blew up. Uh, I think it was a real stroke of good fortune that we found two trucks yeah. that matched identically. One of them mm -hmm. didn't have, in Evans City, Pennsylvania, who would guess that you could find uh, two identical trucks that matched and one uh, didn't operate, it had to be towed. That's the one that, that blew the up. Mm -hmm. But uh, <coughs> the night that that sequence was uh, filmed, I can remember being astounded at the number of people who showed up and I mean mm -hmm. as I recall that was it was like two o'clock or one o'clock in the morning or something like that when that eventually filmed and there were people out with you know huddled in blankets and everything else uh, that kind of surprised me that people would be that interested to see a movie being made in their backyard well I think that's the reason you know it was a in, the, in their view this was a real big time movie and uh, they hadn't ever seen anything like that before, so, dang, we got to go out there and watch him burn that truck. They're going to do that tonight. pleasant things that, that I recall was uh, the sanitary facilities, oh, under, which were non-existent. Non there was a, yeah. an outhouse and uh, uh, there was That's a pump, sure. wasn't there? Right. And yep. you had to, <clears throat> if you wanted to use the John outhouse, uh, you had to carry a bucket of water with you. To, uh, we used to carry 50-gallon uh, or 30-gallon uh, garbage cans full of water from a place about hundred yards away and down a hill. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then we'd fill the back of the commode so that when you hit the handle something would yeah. be in there. To Vince did double duty on, on all of that. All stuff, of that. Though. Absolutely. Yes he did. I mean, he was the only he guy willing did. to go down. He, actually, he was the only guy who took a bath during the whole production I think because he was willing to jump into that cold river at, mm. in November. Well we took baths yeah, but we did. We had to heat the water. Heat the water. Uh, you Vince, and Vince just went and I right and Gary lived there for the most part. Yeah. And then we 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 heat up bathe. enough water to take <laughs> cat baths and and uh, right and we had sleeping on those couches and we had these dummies and mannequins around. Remember? And remember <laughs> that? And some every once in a while there were there were a few incidents where kids from the town would come out at night, you know, like uh -huh. to bring their date out to show them these like weird looking mannequins that were inside this house where they were shooting this, the movie. They were all made up as zombies with ping pong ball eyes. <laughs> <laughs> we use them the for kids are the uh, mannequins. like <laughs> setting them on <laughs> the fire. Kids, and yeah. <laughs> but that, there, the the other thing that, w that that cracked me up was when we had those. Uh, we slept on uh, uh, army uh, army surplus cots, and every day, when George climbed into his cot, he'd say, "This will never hold me." <laughs> <laughs> and then he'd lie down and go to sleep. <laughs> and it would hold him. And after mm -hmm. about ten times of this, he said, this will never hold, hold me. And he went down right through the cot, <laughs> through the canvas and everything. He's on the floor with his feet sticking up in the air. <laughs> I was right That's how you ended up on the couch. <laughs> That's how I ended up on the couch, right? Yeah. I was a large enough object that I got the couch. This, <laughs> this is the original disc, one of the original discs from the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. But we did so much to them, to change them, yes, to alter, we, electronically change we, uh, them. We changed the speed, we used a feedback echo, that's from the, from the playback head back to the record head. And then we also used uh, the echo chamber, the real live echo chamber. And this music, even in 1967, was very old. Because when we reported the use of this music to Capitol 
library, uh, they wrote back and said, where did you get those discs? They're so old. After you use them, please return them to us. That's right. That's right. I've because that. the the uh, composer or whomever was supposed to get royalties from them had long died, and they didn't have any way of handling. So it's it's old. Um, but anyway, we we did modify the uh, the music greatly, and the the initial this is probably interesting. The initial selection of the music tracks. Uh, was up to us. Uh, George Romero said, why don't you pick some discs, uh, something that you feel might fit, um, and make a collection, uh, and then we'll listen to them. And uh, we gave him the final decision on what to use and what not to use. Now you'll hear... ZR2. That was the voice of Capitol <laughs> Records Music Library, <laughs> identifying the cut. Uh, at any rate, then George came up, we all listened to the stuff, mm -hmm. and he said, I like this, 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 and this. And then we proceeded to, to modify the, uh, the music, to add echo and do the things I said before. The music is, I, I think, is a big contributor to the feeling of Living Dead. You know, that uh, kind of gothic. Yeah, it's... It is. Old fashioned terror. Well, that was really our frame of reference. That's right. At the time, because uh, nobody had done anything like this. Um, our frame of reference had to be the Frankensteins, the mummy pictures, um, and this music is is from that era. Uh -huh. So I guess you would say it's music of the what, 40s, 50s, mm -hmm. thereabouts? Uh, brought up, brought forward in time. And even today, they're still using similar music. Yeah. It's it's more modern. Yeah. Arrangements are more modern, but it's it is very similar. So it's it's interesting. Night of the Living Dead. Huh. Forever. I think it was it, it was kind of interesting also the lucky coincidence of the finding duplicate trucks, but also the the uh, Finding a place, finding a house, a house. Yes. that was uh, going to be torn down, so it didn't make mm -hmm. any difference what we did to the place, yeah. because it, once mm -hmm. we were finished with it, they were going to knock it down anyway, and I think it today, still to this day, is a turf farm. Yes, they it is. They grow grass well, there. The last well, time. I mean, it, a lot of that's luck, but you know, I mean, and on a serious note, Really, the way it happened was tenacity. I mean, we yeah. were going to get yeah. that movie made some One damn way, way or, or another. another. Whatever it takes. And I think yeah. it was really at the core of the group, the core of the group, not all ten, but at least seven or eight of us were determined determined yeah. to make the movie. Yeah, because we did look at a number <coughs> of houses, and Carl and Marilyn found one, and the ceilings were too low, and we could have gone mm -hmm. with it and suffered through the hat, but we, we hung in there till we found a place that was... Exactly right, yeah. and, and, and of course we had to Vince fix it. Built, remember, yeah. built a, you couldn't get to it in a vehicle. That's, yeah. that's right. And Vince built, right. went out there and built a bridge over the thing, and yep. he, he, he found old antique mm -hmm. furniture and like fixed the. I mean, he was. And he made a fireplace where there wasn't a fireplace. Right. And right. He made the and created secret, a door. Secret door to the basement, basement door, where yeah. there wasn't yeah. even a basement. Yeah. So it was, and then, and then just furnishing it with. Uh, Things like your coat tree, yes. you know, it's and your your antique radios, and oh, the all of Zenith. us brought stuff yes. out there, and we bought stuff from Goodwill, and you know, before yeah. you knew it, the place was uh, looked it was like furnished it was furnished and looked like it was a, an old farmhouse. Right. Yeah. I wonder how how much a group like this, an entrepreneurial group like this, is responsible for what has happened in general to movie making and the cost of production. You know, as recently as the the remake. Uh, in uh, a couple of a couple of years ago, I think at its largest there were like 115 people on the crew, and you kind of 
stand around and scratch your head if you have that perspective of mm -hmm. being involved in the original movie yeah. and then you stand around and you say well geez 115 people that's more than we had in the cast in the yeah. uh, in the, the first film including the posse and everybody else mm -hmm. and you say hmm, I wonder you know how how much are we really buying here you know it's uh, well you know you can't I mean the problem is uh, if to you know, <laughs> I mean, t theoretically, we shouldn't have been able to do it either. I mean, it's That's what right. we were saying before. We had equipment. <laughs> yeah. We had the tenacity. We had, were willing to go out there and spend all that time when, you know, when, when we all had or were trying well, to. I mean, you guys two. had a real, really going business at, that, at the time. We had one yeah. that we were trying to get going, and we, we, mm -hmm. you know, we all should have probably been back in town uh, looking for the next client. But, you know, I think just that drive and, and desire and, you know, just just took it uh, over the top. And that think, energy. Plus the fact that, you know, that we were, we also, I think, did, <coughs> did in the end, wind up doing it, you know, pretty democratically. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, because we yes. uh, initially, you were going to direct, and I mean, then, right. and then I wound up directing, and all the stuff, I mean, we avoided big fights. <laughs> I dragged you out there and feed you those things! <laughs> profound effect on my life. Uh, I uh, I'd made a film called Eggshells. It was my first feature length film. It was about the disintegration of the of hippiedom and the and the, the troops were coming home from Vietnam. And and the film played the art house circuits. It didn't get many play dates. And so a friend of mine suggested I go to the student union to see this the pr 16 millimeter print of this film. Uh, called Night of the Living Dead, and I went, and and the response from the the audience told me what I what kind of film, the genre that I should get into, how I can make a low budget film without stars or you know or a great deal of money that it was accessible to me, and uh, and so as a result of seeing that film, and with with that sophisticated audience, I. I decided to do a horror film, and it was, I don't know, it was some months later, I guess, uh, that uh, the chainsaw, or that the story that became Chainsaw evolved. Because it was the scariest movie I'd ever seen, when it came time for my partners, Robert Tappert, Bruce Campbell, and myself, to make our first horror film, um, we drew upon Night of the Living Dead a great deal, and it influenced our movie Evil Dead quite a bit. Um, in, uh, in Night of the Living Dead, the horror all takes place in one deserted farmhouse. And um, so we also decided that's a good and cheap place to make a picture. I guess a lot of horror filmmakers finally come to that conclusion. But um, nevertheless, for us, it was Romero who had influenced us. And um, we saw how effective that was. Some place out in the middle of nowhere. The isolation factor was very good. So uh, the location was influenced in our film by Night of the Living Dead. The regional filmmakers seem to be making the most cutting-edge horror films. Well, maybe that's a contradiction in terms for the simple fact that all horror films, to be any good, have to be cutting-edge because everybody is trying to push the envelope when it comes to horror and shock and mood and just the, the, the whole uh, avant-garde and the whole uh, rebellious sort of filmmaking that, uh, that uh, happens in the horror genre. With Night of the Living Dead, it, it became such a big hit and became so memorable with that great title and it being a great movie that people felt that, filmmakers felt that their films, the regional films, could, uh, could do that, that kind of business. And I remember a lot of people trying to do that kind of film and they were retitling, I think, European films, House of the Living Dead and Fangs of the Living Dead. and it was, Everything was the Living Dead. Well, I think it's given it a great uh, shot in the arm because it was a crossover film for a lot of people, uh, including myself, uh, who consider myself sort of educated and hoping to go off and do sort of art films, you know. Suddenly I realized that uh, it was possible to have art that also had a visceral quality to it and could make you jump and sweat and run and laugh. And it sort of released me, you know. Um, I think I might have been doomed to making very serious films 
uh, before seeing that film and then suddenly I realized no you can just let your hair down and have a lot of fun and uh, and still do something that had meaning to it and I think it was the same for the uh, for a lot of the audience and therefore for the whole genre it it released it from just being pulpy done by say cigar smokers who were just trying to exploit and released it into guys who had ideas and, and women uh, who liked to have fun at it but were actual filmmakers that went out there with the camera themselves and got their hands dirty and uh, you know, did the editing themselves. Well, in many ways, actually. I mean, I, I think that films can be influential for good and for bad. I mean, I, I made a movie called Animal House that was so influential that I think it was horrible. I mean, you know, I kept thinking, do I get residuals from all these rip-offs and stuff? But I mean, it was so, it, and Night of the Living Dead inspired so many films. Plus, I think a lot of the makeup, Tom Sullivan did the makeup in our, uh, Evil Dead, and, um, it uh, is fairly similar to the very simple makeup that Romero went with on, uh, on Night of the Living Dead. Uh, plus, just the concept of the walking dead as the source of horror was uh, ripped off. I mean, uh, I was paying homage to uh, Romero when we made uh, Evil Dead. Well, I think everybody who was started out, and a lot of people have made zombie movies. I have made one, and I worked on one called Shockwaves would like to capture some of that film in one of their films. I think we would all like to be able to uh, generate that type of terror in our audiences. And, and I didn't do it. I did not achieve that, um, that level, which uh, I think just goes to show you that there's a lot more to the film than a bunch of you know, actors stumbling up on a porch and trying to get through uh, the window. Because that, that same film seemed to be made uh, with Vincent Price much earlier in Italy as the uh, last man on earth and uh, even though that was very creepy it didn't it didn't generate the same response so I don't think just having a bunch of zombies lumbering around is going to do it there's something there's something more there's something magical maybe it's a once in a lifetime thing I just in terms of breaking new ground in terms of how far you can go with the gore uh, there's uh, I can't quite name there's so many films almost too numerous to mention I mean, films, the Evil Dead films, the uh, uh, Peter Jackson, uh, Peter Jackson's Brain Dead, I believe. I, it, it's ridiculous. Uh, there are homages, and uh, it's 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 amazing. It, it truly is, in so many ways, the Im impact that film has had. <laughs> George was saying our businesses were on hold, our businesses weren't on hold, our entire lives were on hold mm -hmm. during that period through, through getting the commercial business going and making our first feature and, and so on. We just didn't live like normal people. We put everything we had into, <laughs> well, into the film business. You know, it truly was a group effort, yeah. you know, a democratic group effort, but there was also a great deal of raw talent there, a great deal of raw talent, which uh, I don't think we should discount. Oh yeah, For uh, you know all of us involved. Mm -hmm. No, no, had good talents. instincts to start Absolutely. off with. And there is a tendency to do that. I mean, I always say, geez, I, 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 it's hard for me to even watch the movie still because all I see are the flaws. But mm. then every once in a while, I get, you know, much mellower towards it, and I have really fond memories of yeah. all of that. And I think mm -hmm. it is true that we, we, I mean, we did a good job given under the circumstances. Yes. We did a fabulous job. I mean, it's like, yep. uh, and the movie works. It does work. It and does you tend work. to forget that because you get critical mm -hmm. of it and you say, and you start yeah. thinking of what happened and right. this and that, and it should have been that. And we, uh, right. 
but it works. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Stop it! You're ignorant! They're coming for you, Barbara. Stop it! You're acting like a child! Look, they're coming for you! Look! There comes one of them now! I worked with practically everybody in the film. Carl Hardman, Marilyn Eastman, George, Jack, Russ. We all did voiceover work, television, commercial work together in Pittsburgh. I went out to Hollywood back in 66, 67. Shortly, oh I'd say about a month or so while I was out there, I got a call from Carl saying, we're going to make a film, would you like to come home and audition for it? So I flew back from Hollywood to Pittsburgh, ended up getting the part of Barbara, and the rest is history. I played her as she was written. We did a lot of improvisation shooting. We'd have certain dialogue written, there was the working script, but oftentimes we discussed what was to happen in the scene, then improvised the dialogue. For example, the segment where Barbara is sitting down telling Ben about the candy, Johnny being attacked, and she's hot, she undoes does her jacket, that kind of thing. She tells the entire story. That was all ad lib. I remember we did, we did everything in one take. Oh, he was wonderful. Very willing to listen to ideas. He had, I believe, distinct ideas, images, how he wanted it done or how he saw it, but very flexible. We didn't have a lot of stock, film stock to, to burn. We had to, to really keep everything concise. I remember changing, he taught me how to change the film, load the, the, um, the camera in a, a bag right there on set. He was marvelous. A very creative, intense, down-to-earth guy. To this day, he is. I was running to the gas pump. The gas pump, we thought, was firmly attached. George, again, was shooting up. He was kneeling down with the camera right in front of the gas pump. I came running into that pump, hit the pump. It was just sitting there. It wasn't bolted. The thing, heavy sucker, nearly fell on top of George, squishing the fella to death. But it was averted, we caught the thing. He wasn't hurt. Watching it at the premiere, I just marveled that all the takes that we did could be put together into something that even though it didn't cost a million bucks to make, said something. and it. it, it it held your interest. There were some beautiful shots. When I say beautiful, you wonder how could it be beautiful in a horror film? But really, the, the shadows that George figured out to create certain effects, I thought it was great. One of my favorites to this day is the, the shot where George is on the ground, he's shooting up, there's the little music box. Barbara comes by and she touches the top of it, the little doors open. George shoots through it, and just as the little doors open, you see Barbara's face looking through. You can see her eyes in that horror state. Then the, the little doors close again. I thought that was an exquisite shot. We had a wonderful time. I met uh, Patricia Tallman. We all went to the premiere up in San Jose, had a great time. The remake surprised me. Barbara ends up with an Uzi and fatigue, mowing them all down. In a way, I'm, I'm sorry that they did that. To me, it wasn't a remake then. Even though it was in the 90s, yes, women were going to control the world or you know, they 
kick-started their Harleys and roared down the freeway. But I was sorry to see that we changed it that much. But boy, color effects <laughs> are superior to ours. I think it stands out because it truly was one of the first films where the good guys didn't survive. Up to that point in time, if you had a white hat on, no matter what chased you, no matter how horrible the situation, you always ended up alive with that white hat on. In Night of the Living Dead, didn't work out that way. The good people you were hoping were, would survive, you always thought, they're going to make it. At least Ben's going to make it. Didn't. That, I believe, was the profound effect the movie had. It helped change the way horror films were made. Chief, uh, if I were surrounded by six or eight of these things, would I stand a chance with them? Well, there's no problem. If you had a gun, shoot them in the head. That's a sure way to kill them. If you don't get yourself a club or a torch, beat them or burn them. They go up pretty easy. Well, Chief McClellan, how long do you think it will take you until you get the situation under control? Well, that's pretty hard to say. We don't know how many of them there are. We know when we find them, we can kill them. Are they slow moving, Chief? Yeah, they're dead. They're all messed up. Well, they were, they were really good days. They were deadly in many respects, uh. but uh, they were great. They really were great. I think it was uh, also... I mean, how many people really cooperated with us and came yeah. out? People from the advertising, people that we yes. worked with. I mean, there are hundreds well, everyone of people. The big days, those big days with the helicopter, the IIC, yeah. cooperation from IIC, and your and friends in the biz and our friends in the biz yes. came out. Painted, you know, the ambulance. I remember that ambulance. That was the first major prop that I was ever yeah. within ten feet of in my life. Oh and I was yeah. like, my God! It's whoa! Oh, man. Check it out, man! This looks you're, real. You're talking about the blue um, mercury. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, that, that was right. Did, that did I ever tell you the the, the story of that? Yeah, I borrowed that car from uh, a Lincoln dealer who's no longer in business. Can't think of the name though. Probably but because of giving you the car, <laughs> yeah. and then I think, I think the story you're going to tell behind it. Well, you know, well, you prob I probably did tell you, but um, it was Willard. Uh, Willard. Right, that's right, the uh, town of Willard. Willard, I don't know. I don't anyway, know. The, the sign on, we had a black right. sign made. Right. Um, no, it was painted right on the painted car. Painted on the car. It was painted uh, on the car. Washable <laughs> That's why it looked so great. Paint. None of this. <clears throat> Took the car back. <laughs> They um, they removed the the black paint Willard, uh, and it didn't disappear. <laughs> there was a faint image of Willard. Willard. <laughs> so they had, they had to and wind this guy's up name was not Willard. I take it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no it wasn't. <laughs> they had to wind up painting both sides of that station wagon, and they were really hacked. Yeah, they were <laughs> not really uh, <laughs> thrilled. I didn't know that. Yeah, <laughs> they apparently <clears throat> something in the pigmentation of the paint. Mm -hmm. left enough of a residual image that you're <laughs> trying to pass this off as a brand spanking new card. <laughs> well, why does it say Willard on the side? <laughs> well, you see, the police department bought it, and then they, but they never, <laughs> yeah. they never drove it out of here. And I think that there are little, little moments like that that, you, that we have all forgotten about that, uh, well, that no. kind of make the that. The Washington, D.C segment was oh. almost the same yeah. thing where it was just like a pick I remember yeah, it was like we a were picnic. all in we the got downstairs. in a bunch of cars and dro dro drove down yeah. there and mm -hmm. we were and in we the shot downstairs down at 16, studio 16, right? before we that wasn't in the script to go to Washington no no I know and I'm, we I'm were trying to remember we just jumped in the cars we shot yeah. that with uh, Eclairs right 16 uh, yeah uh, yes yeah well, we shot yes. With uh, yeah, right. At the Claire and the uh, was, it, was it was it shot the with a Claire? I don't well, know. Yeah, because it was going to go in the it was going to go in the um, television, be matted into matted the television right. screen. So we figured we might as well shoot sixteen and save some money. Mm -hmm. But we didn't. We started thinking, well, what can this sequence be? And we we have a whole movie where people don't even come out of this farmhouse, and yet this is supposed to be happening on a national, if not worldwide, mm -hmm. scale. Mm -hmm. And so, how can we indicate that? And and um, 
I think I was the first person to mention, well, let's just go to Washington, D.C., zap. Next morning, yeah. Carl Slap had his car made up. <laughs> Slap some flags on Carl's car. I don't Carl's know what car. you went through to do that. <laughs> I wanted to go to Afghanistan, and they, no, it <laughs> yeah. couldn't possible. Remember, well, you, you had, you had a, a big Lincoln, didn't you? Yeah, Carl? you had the Lincoln. Yeah, that was put Carl's, the flags that was your on. car. That's 65 in the, in the Lincoln scene, that, right? that looked great. The same mm -hmm. car we went and, uh, to uh, the drive-in in, I think. What had to be.